From hybrid combat vehicles to hydrogen aircraft tugs, even planes fueled with air and water, the UK military is investing heavily in green tech and researching new forms of fuel. In less than three decades, it has to dramatically cut its consumption and decarbonise defence. But big questions remain. Is a net zero military realistic? What will it look like? And why should Britain go to the trouble when our adversaries almost certainly won't? We should only do this if there is operational advantage in terms of our equipment. We should only embrace technologies that are of value to us. We shouldn't be a crusade and I'm going to, you know, I'll cause a lot of upset by saying that. We shouldn't be a crusade. We should be trying to get to the very best possible outcome, um, embracing new technology as we do, to make sure that it doesn't matter whether they're... In fact, we'd be better than them if we had tanks that have been thought through in terms of the new environment, and they have tanks that are still 20th century. One of the biggest factors in achieving net zero is not actually greening the military, it's the thousands of companies that supply it, making them more climate aware. One of the biggest is Rolls-Royce. At their factory at Filton near Bristol, they manufacture the EJ200, the engine fitted to the Typhoon fighter. It can already run on a 50% blend of sustainable and fossil fuel, and Rolls-Royce is committed to making this and all the other engines it builds run solely on sustainable fuels by 2030. We're still pioneering and into innovation. And Dave Gordon is the director of Rolls-Royce UK and told me the firm is going all out to achieve net zero as fast as possible. We want to be world leaders, and we think we are being world leaders. We've already committed that 70% of our R&D as a company we are going to spend on decarbonisation technologies. So it's an incredibly bold commitment and from our CEO downwards we're actually doing that for real. We recently set up a small modular reactor business that's all about producing an alternative zero carbon form of energy. We've got an investment in a Bristol company called Vertical Aerospace that's looking at uh, airborne taxi market but actually that technology is directly relevant to elementary flying, for example. So again, we're having a really good conversation with the RAF about how potentially that full electrical capability could play into the, into the early trainer side of things. Now, you're absolutely right, that's a competitive market. We want to be at the forefront of it. And so it's all about um, being an early adopter leading. And a big part of that is being in collaboration with people like the RAF to see how as, as UK PLC we can take that forward as well. As a company, Rolls-Royce are aiming to be net zero by 2050, but here at Filton, they're moving much faster and are aiming to fully decarbonise this entire factory by the end of 2022. And how fast are we going to see a Typhoon or whatever aircraft flying on this sustainable fuel? When's it going to happen? That's the question people always so, ask. So I think Typhoon, in order to meet the Chief's 2040 target, Typhoon needs to happen this decade. And I think uh, if we look at where all of the flying hours, and I, I can look at Rolls-Royce data and see where the RAF's flying hours are, and a huge part of it is this engine. And so this is a huge part of the UK's government's carbon footprint. So why wouldn't you want to move into that space? Where's the future? Well, over my shoulder is Tempest, um, in, in another part of the factory is where we're doing our development uh, work around the next generation of power and propulsion capability. And that engine is being designed to run on synthetic fuels right off the bat. And what we see in that environment is we can actually get greater performance because we actually see improved uh, specific fuel consumption, or S SFC. So how much energy effectively you can take out of that fuel and with some of that improvement, we can design that into the platform and think about how we harness that. So all of our products going forward, any new product we introduce on, into service will run on this stuff because it's, it's managing obsolescence and it's effectively extending the life and therefore extending the life of the RAF's platforms as well. Yeah, that, that, that affects Sid their Hallam spent 30 years as an RAF engineer, working on fast jets like the Jaguar, Harrier and Tornado. Now he works for Defence Equipment and Support, known as DE&S, the part of the MOD that deals with procurement. He's based here at Filton, overseeing delivery of the Typhoon engine. 
He told me that from now on, firms trying to win MOD contracts will be partly assessed on what's called their social value, and that includes their strategy on climate change. What that actually means in practice is that companies like Rolls-Royce and other companies in the sector are going to find that uh, when they come to bid for a contract with us, with the ENS, a big part of that contract evaluation is going to be looking at that social value. And in fact, at least 10% of the weighting of how we uh, evaluate contracts in the future is going to be based on social value. How, how serious is it going to be in terms of a factor for people to winning contracts? Are you I mean, you're really going to drill down and go, if you haven't got the 10%, you're not, you're not going to get anything? As I say, it will be part of the uh, contract evaluation criteria put in in advance, at least 10% of those criteria for competitive contracts will be based on social value. Since 2020, the UK military's jets and helicopters have been cleared to run on 50% sustainable fuel. The reason they don't? Well, the RAF says it's because it can't currently find a reliable and cost-effective supply. One place they do use it, though, is here in the Netherlands. We've come to visit Leeuwarden Air Base, about 90 miles north of Amsterdam. It opened in 1938, and as you drive in, you can see some of the jets that have flown from here. The base is home to 322 Squadron of the Royal Netherlands Air Force, a unit that's already fully embracing sustainability. The Dutch military began experimenting with biofuels way back in 2010, initially in helicopters. They began using them operationally two years ago, first in their F-16s and now in their F-35s too. These jets are flying on a mix of ordinary jet fuel and cooking oil. And by 2050, the Dutch Air Force intends to reduce its dependence on fossil fuels by almost three quarters. We're blending up to 5% of uh, HEFA uh, biofuels into the regular jet fuel so, so that we get uh, sustainable air fuel for the aircraft. HEFA is uh, hydro-treated uh, esters and acid fetties or like uh, you, you might want to say fried chips fat used and uh, so we can use that for the for the aircraft. The biofuel is tested in the normal way in Leeuwarden's lab. These technicians checking the purity and things like the level of antifreeze and water and the results are surprising. You treat this fuel exactly the same way as you do normal JPA? Yeah. Fuel you use it's in actually jets. the same here in a laboratory. Exactly the same. Yeah. Uh, and in, you were saying in some ways it's actually slightly better quality in certain tests than you would get in other. Uh, it's, it's higher. I mean, um, usually the, the normal is something lower, like 11%, and this is maybe 13% with over there with a test with the uh, antifreeze. And it looks exactly the same as. Yeah, the it looks fuel, exactly no the same. You you actually can't see the difference. If you get a normal kerosene here and a bio there, you can't see the difference. Another surprise is how the Dutch military is powering its vehicles. While the MOD here is intending to have a completely electric white fleet by 2027, in the Netherlands they favour hydrogen and already use it in many of their cars, vans and even forklift trucks. The issue with EV is that uh, for uh, having electrical vehicles is that you need a very powerful grid. That's one of the issues we have right now, infrastructural, because that's something you have to deploy, which costs a lot of money. And so we're exploring what hydrogen can really do for us, what the limitations are, but also what the obvious uh, pros are from, from working with hydrogen and learn from that experience. So we're not waiting for technology to develop, but we're stepping into it right now to, to learn and, and, and evolve for the, for the near future and get greener. Of course, the UK military is bigger and more deployed than its Dutch ally, but for both of them, the green agenda is now feeding into every decision they make. It will shape how and to some extent where they operate, and crucially the way they're regarded by the increasingly climate-conscious public they serve. What we have seen, uh, you know, and this is where UK defence absolutely is, I would say, on the leading edge of, of uh, greening its estate and, and trying to look at greening its logistics, greening its fleet, is that uh, the footprint that we can have uh, as we go into operations, whether that is uh, of an adversarial conflict nature or whether that is in order to defend arguably global security or, or economic uh, supply lines, is that we can absolutely reduce that 
that footprint. Uh, and it doesn't need to have the, the Camp Bastion style gas guzzling, uh, you know, effects that we've seen in the past. And, and there is an argument that says that, you know, whoever manages to green their, their military and defense first will have first mover advantage. And there will be a welcome in a way, I think by people uh, of a military that is able to do that. The MOD has less than three decades to decarbonise, to end emissions from jets like these and drastically cut the CO2 produced by its ships, armour and vast estate. As we've seen throughout this series, there's a lot going on. Climate change now seen as a capability issue, one the forces know they have to urgently address. Can it be done? Well, the people we've spoken to firmly believe so. The goal of a net zero UK military now firmly embedded in the DNA of defence. Simon Newton, Forces News, Bristol. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel.